Hello and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Memo's Weekly Review with me, Nassim Ahmed, and our regular guest, Moin Robbani. Hello, Moin. Thank you for joining us again. Hi, Nassim. Uh, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. It's a pleasure, likewise. Uh, we will start off with the horrific images that's coming out, out of uh, Rafa. Um, Israel targeted a UN-run safe zone, killing dozens of Palestinians, stories of decapitated babies, burning tents. So it's really shocking images. So we'll, we'll speak to more about that. And then the implications of Hamas capturing Israeli sol- soldiers in northern Gaza, uh, where there has been continuing fighting between Hamas and Israeli forces. There's claims and counterclaims about that. Uh, we'll discuss that as well. Fallout from last week's ICJ and ICC judgment. Uh, there's been a lot said since and we'll be reviewing some of that. And uh, one of the consequences of that is Israel's weaponization of tax revenues against Palestinians in response to three European states recognizing Palestinian state. And we'll be reflecting on President's, President Biden's floating pier being washed away uh, by waves. Uh, so is this a metaphor for something more than simply a pier being washed away? We'll, we'll get Moin's thoughts on that. But Moin, if we can begin with some breaking news, there's nothing confirmed at the moment, but there is breaking news that Israeli, uh, sorry, Egyptian soldiers and Israeli soldiers exchanged fire. Uh, can you say more about that? And um, I know details are vague at the moment, but I think it's worth us uh, responding to this because it is such a huge development if it is the case. <laughs> Well, as as you said, um, there's a lot we don't know. Um, rep- the available reports state that one Israeli, one Egyptian soldier was killed by Israeli fire, and a number of others wounded. Um, the Israelis have been insisting um, that they were responding to Egyptian forces, which opened fire first. This um, incident took place on the border between Egypt and the Gaza Strip. And the background is, of course, that as part of its offensive into the Rafah region, um, the Israeli military has been seizing control of that border zone, um, what it calls the Philadelphia Corridor. And in doing so, it has um, violated a um, core aspect of the 1979 Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty, which limits the forces Israel can place on its side of the border, that it's the so-called Area D, um, both in numbers and materiel, and Israel has far exceeded that. What would be interesting to learn, um, if we end up learning anything at all, um, is whether Egyptian forces opened fire in an organized manner because, for example, um, the Israeli forces uh, crossed uh, the border into Egyptian territory, whether this was um, an individual soldier who took the initiative uh, without having orders to confront the Israeli military. But it's clearly a serious incident. Um, and um, as as you noted, it's um, uh, breaking news and we'll have to wait to learn more. Yeah, it is a worrowing development. I mean, the, the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, um, Camp David Accords, is often described as a soft peace. Uh, I don't think it's one of those uh, peace treaties which is popular with Egyptians or you know, um, with, with Arab countries. So we'll see how that develops. It's been one of the foundational pillars of Israel's safety in the Middle East. And if that was to be threatened in any way, of course, that will have huge implications. And we will follow that story. And next week, we may have something more to um, speak about. But let's move turn our attention to um, what's been happening in Rafah, in Gaza, especially overnight. We've seen shocking images of beheaded babies. Uh, Palestinians don't seem to have anywhere left to escape, you know, their mosques, their schools, their hospitals, churches, everything has been destroyed. Now, it seems Israel is dropping 2,000 pound bombs on uh, UN tents and shelters. And that's quite a shocking development. Uh, What's your thoughts on the events of last night? Yes, uh, shocking and horrific development, but unfortunately, um, hardly unique in terms of what what we have been seeing 
in the Gaza Strip during the past eight months. I think the immediate background to this is um, the recent ruling by the International Court of Justice in The Hague in response to a further appeal from South Africa um, in which the ICJ judges by a majority of 13 to two ordered Israel to immediately halt its offensive into um, uh, Rafah. The United States basically pretended nothing happened. It hasn't yet commented um, uh, on this. And um, uh, I think that gave Israel the assurance that it had a green light to continue. And I think it's also interesting that the weaponry used by Israel, these 2,000 pound bombs you mentioned, are precisely the munitions that US President Joe Biden in a recent interview with CNN claimed um, uh, that he was holding up the delivery of them to Israel precisely because he did not want them used in uh, Rafah. This was uh, one more rhetorical um, uh, effort by uh, Biden to lay out a red line for Israel. And as soon as Israel crossed it, um, Biden and his spokespersons uh, shifted shifted the goalposts. Um, this area that Israel hit was, as you said, a tent encampment that had been designated as a safe zone um, right next to a um, uh, logistics depot um, established by uh, UNRWA, the United Nations Refugee uh, Agency for uh, Palestinians. And basically people were incinerated, uh, burned alive, beheaded babies, absolutely um, horrific scenes. And, you know, this is Israel's way of demonstrating to the court, um, not only to the international community, but also to its Western backers, we will do as we please. There's nothing you can do to stop us. And the reason there's nothing you, you can do to stop us is because we have the ironclad protection of the United States, which agrees with us that Palestinians are subhuman, that they're irrelevant, expendable human scum, and we can kill them in any way we want, as many as we want, and nothing will happen. Now you look at the responses, there has been widespread um, uh, condemnation, but I think eight months into a genocide, um, verbal condemnation is meaningless um, when it is not accompanied by concrete action. And thus far, there has been no concrete action, whether from Arab states that have issued condemnation, European states, um, or indeed um, any, uh, any others, uh, with the exception of South Africa. There is one more um, uh, response that I found interesting, and that was a response of Israel itself. In the wake of what Israelis are describing or had been warning as a diplomatic tsunami, which now appears to be gathering pace in the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, European states recognizing Palestinian statehood and so on. Netanyahu um, described this horrific attack as a tragic accident. Um, and, you know, you can kind of dismiss that, but it's, it's a change of tone from either celebrating these attacks or from uh, laying uh, the blame exclusively um, uh, at the feet of Palestinians or making bogus claims that it was a um, uh, uh, errant Palestinian missile or what have you. So even though Israel is maintaining that it was targeting Hamas commanders who were in this encampment, kind of a routine um, uh, propaganda response in such circumstances, it also went out of its way um, to indicate that it views this as a tragic accident, that it will be investigating. Now, you look at, you know, hundreds of similar attacks Israel has conducted during the past um, eight months. It hasn't even bothered to, more often than not, hasn't even bothered to provide a pretext or a rationale um, or to um, describe it as, as tragic and to say it is um, investigating. Another response was from um, the United Nations um, uh, so-called peace coordinator um, in Jerusalem, um, a Norwegian diplomat, Tor Wenesland. On the one hand, he strongly condemned the attack, but then he called on the Israeli military 
to conduct a thorough investigation to get to the truth and to hold those responsible accountable. Um, you know, anyone who is even remotely familiar with Israel's investigation processes, if they wanted any accountability, accountability at all, would never suggest that such an investigation needs to be conducted by the Israelis uh, themselves. The purpose of Israeli investigations is basically to whitewash Israeli crimes. Um, uh, and typically the Israelis will announce they're conducting an investigation Usually they don't, and then nothing happens. And if a year later a journalist asks about it, we'll get back to you. But, I mean, for someone of Tor Venisland's knowledge to even suggest that Israel, rather than any independent international or UN body, should be in charge of such an investigation is, I think, to say the very least, uh, profoundly disappointing. Yeah, we'll be picking up on many of the themes you mentioned uh, in your answer later on. But if we can stick to Gaza mm -hmm. um, in the next couple of minutes, just to discuss some of the fighting that's taking place in northern Gaza between Israeli soldiers and Hamas fighters. Hamas has said that it has captured uh, Israeli soldiers. Israel has denied that. Um, how much of a setback um, sh should it be the case that they have actually captured, which there's footage of it, uh, how much of a setback would the capture of Israeli soldiers be for Israel, given that northern Gaza has allegedly been cleared many, many months ago? How much of a setback would that be? Well, I think if, if these reports are confirmed, it would be hugely significant um, on a number of levels. First of all, um, the Israelis, as you mentioned, have claimed not once, but repeatedly, that they have effectively um, eliminated Hamas from the northern Gaza Strip, including from uh, Jabalia and the Jabalia refugee camp. What Hamas is asserting, and there is some video evidence that appears to confirm it, though I think we do need to keep an open mind until there is definitive confirmation, was that it lured an Israeli elite unit into um, a tunnel and managed to kill, wound, or capture all of its members and to do the same for a backup unit that then came in um, to rescue them. So first of all, it means that Hamas, um, uh, the Qassam Brigades, the military wing of Hamas, remains a coherent and effective fighting force in the northern Gaza Strip. Secondly, it sends a clear message to Israel that you are using um, the, the campaign to retrieve your captives and hostages as one of your main rationales for continuing this, uh, this, camp, uh, this campaign. But what is happening in practice is that you're not only losing more dead and wounded, but the number of captives uh, are increasing. So I think this needs to be seen not just at the military level, but also at the political and psychological level. And um, I think we should see this also in combination with the recent uh, missile attack from uh, the southern Gaza Strip onto the greater Tel Aviv area. Uh, militarily, of course, um, as, as with previous such attacks, it's, it's not of particular um, significance. It causes some disruption in this case. I think... Um, four Israelis were uh, reported wounded. But again, it sends a um, strong political and psychological message. Almost a year into this war, in which Israel has been declaring one victory after another, um, and in which Israel is claiming it needs to go into Rafah to administer a final and definitive and comprehensive defeat on Hamas, not only is Hamas still conducting um, what would appear to be complex military operations in the northern Gaza Strip, but it's still capable of hitting the Tel Aviv region from the southern Gaza Strip. Hmm. I mean, Israel seems to be way past uh, borrowed times, it's well, moved way beyond that. And, and you get a sense of that from the way a number of countries have reacted in, to the ICJ and ICC um, judgment last week. 
Uh, we mentioned that the attack last night follows um, the ICJ ruling, uh, calling on Israel to stop its attack on uh, Rafah to immediately halt that. In response to that, a uh, number of European countries uh, use um, chief policy, uh, foreign policy advisor uh, Joseph Borrell. He said that everybody agrees that the rulings of the ICJ are binding and they have to be implemented. And um, what surprised me, certainly, is also the response of Germany uh, to the ICC judgment. Germany said that if arrest warrants are issued, then Germany would uh, step in to uh, basically arrest Jov Galant and uh, Netanyahu. So that, to me, was a shocking development. Uh, so do you do you believe that there's a huge been a huge shift uh, to me as i said that israel is living on borrowed times is moved past that now and yesterday's attack on uh rafa with the decapitated babies um which is which was meant to be a red line for americans and the brits who haven't really said much but definitely the eu and germany have seemed to have moved on their position I think these are significant developments. Um, I wouldn't want to exaggerate uh, their significance because when eight months into a genocidal campaign, um, you finally begin hearing some people in Europe make some statements that appear somewhat rational. On the one hand, let's not give them too much credit uh, for finally beginning to see um, a little bit of the light. Uh, but at the same time, uh, words need to be met with action, and we have seen absolutely nothing at that level yet. What, what I thought was interesting about Borrell's response, in addition um, to what you said, he also stated explicitly that we will now have to choose between our support for international law and the international institutions that uphold international law. We will have to choose between those on the one hand and our support for Israel on the other hand. In other words, support for Israel and support for international law are two fundamentally incompatible policies. Um, and as you mentioned, I think the response of European governments is particularly relevant here because unlike uh, the United States, these are all state parties to the International Criminal Court. These are countries that have all ratified, uh, unlike Israel and the United States, uh, but along with the Palestinians, these are all countries that have ratified the Rome Statute. These are all countries that have celebrated um, all the previous uh, arrest warrants issued by the International Criminal Court, most prominently in the case of Russian President Vladimir Putin, but also um, the various um, arrest warrants uh, and, and, and uh, trials conducted of African warlords and so on. So I think if these um, governments were now to come out and be entirely dismissive of the ICC prosecutors applications for arrest warrants of Israeli leaders, not only would it make a um, complete mockery of their supposed support for uh, these institutions and international law, but it really would be the final coffin um, in, in uh, the final nail rather in, in the coffin of their rules-based uh, international order a situation that would be simply untenable. You know, maybe when Israel is quietly expanding uh, settlements in the West Bank, you know, with a few houses here, a few trailers there, they could look the other way and pretend nothing is happening. But in this situation, um, to be dismissive, uh, you know, to parrot Secretary, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and say the, the case is meritless uh, and so on was simply not a tenable proposition for them. And I've been watching closely the, the fallout from the ICC judgment last week. And um, some of it's just uh, really uh, unbelievable. I mean, what, what so many U.S. politicians, lawmakers in Congress, they kept on focusing on this 
idea of moral equivalence between Hamas and Israel. Uh, it seems like they were taking their um, lines from an Israeli playbook. Uh, it seems quite obvious. Another thing that, that struck me is how quickly Israel released videos and footage claiming or supporting their narrative that Palestinian or Hamas fighters had committed genocide. And one of those was uh, a, a video of um, Israeli female Israeli soldiers and um, it was clearly doctored. It was clearly um, a, a, a mistranslation of what was happening. And uh, it was being shared by a number of Israeli influencers and um, uh, billionaires in the U.S. who support Israel. And this is a doctored video pushing the rape narrative. And it came out immediately after the ICC issued its judgment. And I, I found that uh, such an obvious attempt to obfuscate and uh, derail the ICC story. That was one of my observations. And w w what did you see that was quite um, note that was um, uh, yes. you know, interesting in the week since the ICC issued its judgment? Yes, the, this, this um, mass rape narrative that people who have closely examined it are increasingly characterizing as the mass rape hoax is the gift that keeps on giving um, to Israeli Hasbara, to Israeli uh, uh, propaganda. And I think the first question one has to ask is, you know, if the facts are so well established, why does Israel time after time after time need to engage in this kind of fraudulent practice of deliberately mistranslating um, uh, statements, or in addition to the incident you mentioned, um, displaying a Palestinian father and son um, in Israeli custody, speaking in front of an Israeli flag, um, uh, confessing how they jointly, together with a number of other relatives, uh, raped uh, uh, women on October 7th. It's, it's simply not credible. Um, it, I think Israel really has gotten to the point of being unable to preach to other than the converted. And, you know, this story, it comes out on, on the eve of every, every, on the eve of every major international um, legal uh, development, new life is breathed into it. Uh, it was, again, resuscitated, just as Israeli forces were going into a Shifa hospital and so on. And I, I suspect most people are beginning to see through this. Um, not only, you know, is it constantly uh, revived and resuscitated, but increasingly fraudulent means um, uh, to promote it. In this case, completely deliberately mistranslating things to um, uh, to give it a substance that it otherwise doesn't have. But beyond that, um, what if everything that the Israelis are claiming is true? What if the truth is even worse? than what the Israelis are claiming. How does that in any way um, uh, justify um, or explain or give any legitimacy to war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of genocide um, for which there can be no um, uh, defense? Um, if you're committing indefensible crimes, then there is nothing that has been done to you that can um, justify uh, your conduct. And I think, you know, <laughs> that's, I think that's what people around the world are increasingly um, uh, concluding that, that, you know, Israel, which is addicted to playing the victim, um, uh, it's this unique combination of the, the, the victim aggressor, seems to think that if they can persuade enough people that Palestinians are some kind of diabolical, evil, subhuman force, uh, that then they can do as they please and burn people alive in their tents and decapitate Palestinian babies and, and, and destroy, systematically destroy hospitals and, and all the rest of it. And it's, it's Israel's problem is it's not working anymore. Yeah, I think that the assumption from the Israeli side is that um, the, the level of indoctrination Israelis go through uh, and radicalization 
uh, which causes or leads them to believe that Palestinians are barbarians, Muslims and Arabs are barbarians, is 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 you know something that happens across the world, and it's not the case. Um, well, how, how do you dehumanize a child burnt to a crisp by an American bomb dropped by an Israeli airplane? Um, uh, how do you dehumanize entire families incinerated? In their tents, um, uh, in uh, in an area designated by Israel itself as as a safe zone, it might work very well in Tel Aviv, um, but it's it's not working in Johannesburg, it's not working in Hamad, um, it's not working in London, and it's not even working in large parts of the United States anymore. Hmm. And what was interesting is who didn't share the. Uh, rape hoax story uh, and uh, clearly people are, re are not willing to believe in the Israeli propaganda and the lies because it was so obviously exposed by uh, many many uh, experts on social media and that, that was a positive sign for me that this rape hoax story did not um, grab the attention of people who otherwise before 7 October or at the early stages would have believed it. But I think more and more people are realizing that, you know, they're just being used as tools to peddle Israeli lies. And that realization is is growing even more. Um, I, I would, I would, sorry, I, I would just like to make a clarification here about what the rape hoax story does and does not entail. Um, whether or not there was any sexual violence on, on the 7th of October is one question, um, and that does need to be properly investigated um, and so on. But that is not the Israeli claim. The Israeli claim is mm -hmm. not that, um, uh, you know, um, there were specific individual cases of sexual violence on the 7th of October. Israel is claiming that, is a claim is that there was a mass organized premeditated, systematic campaign of rape and other forms of sexual violence against Israeli women on the 7th of October. That's the hoax. And here I find it interesting that if you look at the um, application uh, submitted by ICC prosecutor Karim Khan for um, uh, warrants of arrest for the three Hamas leaders, um, the sexual violence that he claims to have evidence for concerns sexual violence against um, uh, women who are in captivity in the Gaza Strip after 7th of October, not for um, any incidents or campaign within Israel on the 7th of October. And I found it telling that given the amount of attention that he has devoted to this question, that he doesn't have the confidence um, to seek arrest warrants for that himself. Hmm. Another story I think that deserves our attention is the performance of Karim Khan himself since he uh, requested um, the issuance of arrest warrants uh, last week. And one thing that came, well, grabbed my attention is his interview with uh, CNN, where he said that um, and a Western official uh, came uh, told him that the court is meant to be used for Africans and thugs like Putin only and not for our Western allies. So um, Karim Khan seems to, you know, have uh, pushed back against that um, and he wants to change the image of the ICC. I mean, ICC throughout its history um, has um, issued errors once against 47 out of 50 individuals that were tried, all African. You know, 47 out of 50 is all African. So I think, do you think Harim Khan um, generally wants to change the image of the ICC as being a, a weapon that's used against African leaders? And and can he, can he be successful? I mean, he surprised many by even uh, applying for this uh, arrest warrant and taking on the um, Israelis and his Western backers well, I would say backers because they supported him. Uh, Khan was supported by the Israelis and the Brits and the Americans, but he has decided to issue this uh, arrest warrant. Uh, so have you been surprised? And do you think he can uh, succeed in um, um, 
undermining or not undermining but by breaking away from the history of the ICC constantly attacking um or charging african leaders well this this exchange related by khan demonstrates that those who were characterizing the ICC as for example the international criminal court for africa or the international caucasian court have been right all along um secondly Yes, um, uh, Karim Khan did finally bite the bullet and issue applications for the arrest of, of two Israeli leaders. But let's not give him too much credit. I think he um, was painted into a corner. I think he acted only because uh, he felt he had no uh, choice but to do otherwise. Um, he was in a position where there was a growing international clamor for him to act. He was put in a situation where the principles that he said would govern his um, uh, tenure were completely shorn of any legitimacy based on previous actions he had taken and the hypocrisy became too much to bear. And he was put in a position where he was being constantly pilloried even by his own peers. So I don't think Khan acted out of a genuine desire to enhance the legitimacy of the ICC, legit legitimacy, I should add, which he had um, done a lot to demolish uh, during uh, the first two years of his tenure. He acted because he was left with no choice. Now, I think an argument can be made that he chose to issue these applications for the arrest warrants of um, Israeli and Palestinian leaders simultaneously because he wanted to avoid the um, uh, impression of singling out either uh, one or the other, even though the arrest warrants would be for um, uh, quite uh, different crimes. But having said that, he is still playing politics. The investigation that he is in charge of goes back to 2014. So why does history for Karim Khan begin on October 7th? Why has he ignored apartheid settlement and a variety of other crimes that took place between two, June of 2014 and the 7th of October, 2023, which he has supposedly been investigating for a much longer time than he has been investigating um, events during the, the uh, last eight months. It just doesn't add up unless, unless you take the view that Karim Khan was determined to take his first actions on this file in a way that made Palestinians not only as culpable as Israelis, but judging by his initial step of issuing three applications for the arrest of Palestinians and only two for the arrest of Israelis to make them seem more um, uh, culpable. So there are many, many questions about um, uh, Karim Khan's uh, conduct in office, very few of which reflect positively on him. But having said that, I think um, we should take satisfaction that he was finally forced uh, to take action, not only to defend his office, um, but to defend the very legitimacy uh, of the court. And in doing so, took steps that, as we have been discussing, are um, uh, not only legally, but also politically of enormous importance. Another thing that's become clear, well, clear to me anyway, is how the Israelis take out their anger and frustration on the Palestinians. Uh, the ICJ issues a ruling on Friday, and over the weekend, Israel attacks Rafah in the most horrific way. And similarly, last week, three European countries said they would recognize Palestine. We spoke about that in our last show, Spain, Ireland, and Norway. And what did Israel do? It reacted by, again, punishing Palestinians um, by cutting off Tax revenue, uh, tax revenue. Sorry, um, which goes to the Palestinians. So, speak to that. And and what is the you know um, where does this tax um, system that's been used 
and weaponize consistently, constantly against the Palestinians. Where where does the fault lie in that tax system, and why Israel constantly punishes Palestinians for its um, diplomatic failures to win over the West uh, on this issue? Well, what um, Israel did is first its finance minister um, took the, in his view, the retaliatory measure of ceasing the transfer of the monthly transfer of Palestinian tax receipts to the Palestinian Authority in um, uh, Ramallah. Um, to make a long story short, in 1994, at the beginning of the Oslo process, Israel and the PLO signed the so-called Paris Protocol, um, in which Israel was able to achieve its main demand of maintaining the enforced common market between Israel and um, the occupied territories. And, Israel, and the Palestinians agreed that import duties, um, taxes, and so on that are meant to accrue to the Palestinian Authority would be collected by Israel on its behalf. And the Israelis agreed that the, um, all the monies that they collected on behalf of the Palestinian Authority, which, is, which are Palestinian and not Israeli funds, would be transferred in full minus a uh, administrative fee to the Palestinian Authority on a monthly basis. It didn't take long for the Israelis to begin using um, this arrangement as a political weapon and withholding the transfer of, again, what are Palestinian tax receipts and customs duties and so on to um, refuse to transfer them to the Palestinian Authority in order to exercise political pressure on the Palestinians. So that's the fundamental problem. Um, many people believe the Palestinians should have never agreed to this um, arrangement to begin with. But just as important, Israel has been repeatedly using this arrangement as a um, uh, method of political pressure. That's that's the first um, uh, retaliatory measure, if you will. And as as you mentioned, you know, Israel has a problem with someone more powerful. It takes it out on on a weaker party. In this case, um, uh, the Palestinians. Secondly, um, the Israeli foreign minister uh, stated that he would prohibit the Spanish consulate in Jerusalem from providing any consular services to Palestinian residents of the occupied territories. I mean, imagine, you know, that um, uh, the brazenness of, um, uh, inf of, of informing a foreign consulate uh, who it may and who it may not um, uh, provide consular services to. And then the Israeli foreign minister went, went one step further and reminded um, uh, Spain of its horrible experience of living under jihadi Islamic rule um, for several hundred years in Al-Andalus, displaying an extraordinary ignorance of not only um, uh, general history and Iberian history, but even of Jewish history, um, because it was under the so-called um, jihadi Muslim rule um, that Iberian Jews um, experienced what they refer to as their golden age. And it was after the fall of this jihadi, so-called jihadi Muslim rule in, um, uh, in Spain at the end of the 15th century that the Iberian Jews, known as a Sephardim, um, were forced to convert uh, and then collectively um, uh, expelled. Where did they go? Well, you know, some went to Holland, um, uh, some went to other places, but most ended up choosing to live under another so-called jihadi Islamic entity, namely the Ottoman um, uh, Empire. So, you know, th this, this kind of um, knee-jerk Islamophobia, which Israel and its apologists have been doing so much to promote and to fund and to spread, particularly since 9-11, um, uh, makes a reappearance here in the context of a um, diplomatic spat between Israel and Spain. And why? Because Spain 
recognized that Palestinians have rights. I've always believed that Zionism requires a complete fabrication of uh, Jewish and Muslim relationships in history. Uh, and it, it needed to vilify Muslims and present Jewish presence in the Middle East as being one of constantly you know, constant oppression and facing existential threats, which is, of course, not the case. Muslim leaders throughout history. I mean, I did a debunk uh, video about this, just showing how Muslims throughout history have saved Jews um, and maintained their presence in Palestine when it was Christians, well, some Christians who expelled them. Uh, and one of the arguments I think you could make is that <clears throat> it's because of Muslims um, behaving or acting in the interest of Jews that you have centuries of Jewish continuous Jewish existence in Palestine, which Zionists now use and say, oh, we have continuous presence in the Middle East or in Jerusalem, and therefore we have a right to Palestine. But who allowed and permitted this continuous presence of Jews in Jerusalem if it wasn't the Muslims from the time of Caliph uh, Prophet Muhammad all the way down to the Ottomans and even now? Um, yeah, and, and you'll never hear um, uh, Zionists uh, reminding us that the most horrific massacre um, of uh, Jews in uh, in Palestine was conducted by the Crusaders uh, once mm. they seized um, uh, control of uh, of Jerusalem and blood was literally um, flowing um, uh, through the streets. But you know, in 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 the contemporary Zionist narrative, um, Israel is a Western European state. Um, it minimizes uh, the persecution of, of, of uh, Jews in Europe. Um, it has established now its main supporters are the European uh, far right, the ideological inheritors of, of, of Nazism and uh, neo-Nazism. And of course, it has to vilify and dehumanize Palestinians, Arabs, and uh, Muslims uh, more broadly. I think added to that, I think... I want to ask you about uh, one of the other claims that have been continuously made by the Israelis, which is that if you recognize the Palestinian state, as Norway and two other European countries did, their argument is that, uh, of course, it's completely fallacious, that you are rewarding terrorism. What about rewarding someone committing genocide, which the Saudis and the so-called um, uh, well, through the Abraham Accords, are doing. What does it mean for the international community when you reward someone committing a genocide in this manner? So, yes, you can speak about rewarding uh, terrorists. What about rewarding someone who the ICC and the ICJ and the UN are saying is committing, more or less, committing genocide? So what does that say? And what, what, the, what kind of world would we be in when you're rewarding someone complicit or Carrying well, and, out genocide. And who's, who's making this argument exactly? The Israelis. The Israelis is say it, you're, is, you're it, is it Israel that 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 was established um, on the ashes of Palestine as a result on the Nakba, and and who exactly is supporting them in this argument? The United States. This is the United States, which was established on the basis of a um, uh, successful military campaign. Um, against um, uh, Great Britain, of which uh, the American colonies um, uh, were a part. I mean, let's not be so naive as to think um, uh, that uh, every state that exists today was established on the basis of a weekend away at camp um, uh, in which marshmallows were toasted on a fire. It certainly wasn't the case in um, uh, Algeria. Um, uh, or in Vietnam, or in many of these other places. And and in fairness, yes, um, were it not for the past eight months, people would be completely ignoring the question of Palestine and let Israel have its um, uh, way with them, as they have been doing um, for many years previously. But at the same time, um, uh, you know, what Israel is basically saying is, it doesn't matter that these people have internationally recognized inalienable rights. It doesn't matter that we're illegally occupying them and engaging in all kinds of war crimes and crimes against humanity, and now um, uh, also uh, genocide. You need to reward us and let us continue acting with total impunity um, rather than make any effort to actually bring 
the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people to fruition. You're not even allowed to recognize the rights that exist. Maybe on a related point, I mean, do, do you think the U.S. has reached the limit of its desire or willingness to pressure Israel? Uh, because there's no pretense of, of there being a red line in him. Um, we saw Israel enter Gaza and bomb Gaza, uh, sorry, uh, Rafah, 2,000-pound uh, bombs on tents, and that, that's quite horrific and shocking, even though the U.S. over through you know many months said that Rafah was a red line. And it seems to me, you know, every time the IC, the ICC or the UN intervene against Israel on behalf of Palestine, Washington and London automatically revert back to their, you know, ironclad support for Israel. So they, they say one thing, and then as soon as the IC, one of the international institutions says something against Israel, um, they cannot help but, you know, return back to the status quo position of offering ironclad support. So I think the way I look at it is, is they've reached the limit of their capacity to be able to exert any kind of influence on Israel. Of course, it's just nothing but words, but I don't think um, there'll be any more from the Biden administration, certainly, because as I said, there's an election and there's an international growing campaign against Israel. And therefore, they will, it's very unlikely they, will, they, they can do anything more. Yes, I, I would make two points. The first is um, uh, it was actually made by Daniel Levy, the head of the U.S. Middle East Project, in a recent um, uh, interview. And he pointed out that the U.S. position on this is that only Washington has a right to criticize Israel. Um, Washington can set red lines for Israel. Washington um, uh, can tell Israel what to do and what not to do. But God forbid anyone else, even the world's highest court um, uh, or, or the United Nations or any other organization, try to prescribe certain forms of behavior for Israel. Then the U.S. goes all out um, condemning and seeking to minimize and, and dismiss those efforts because, again, Washington and Washington alone has, has the right to, um, uh, to tell to criticize uh, Israel. Secondly, regarding this latest red line and all the previous um, uh, Israel, U.S. statements about Israel's conduct, which are critical in one way or another, I think we've had enough examples, certainly over the last eight months, arguably over the last eight decades, that we can now definitively conclude that these statements are really made for one purpose and one purpose alone. They're in response to growing domestic and international pressure on the U.S. government to do something. So it comes out with these purportedly um, uh, bold statements like um, Rafa has a red line, we've suspended the delivery of 2,000 pound bombs and everything. And then those seize the headlines for a few days and everyone begins congratulating um, uh, Washington for finally putting its foot down and, and taking a firm line uh, with Israel. And then of course, absolutely nothing happens. Um, the red line uh, was, um, uh, the red line was basically a river of blood in a safe zone uh, in, in Rafah. And um, I think we need to see such statements and such positions as really an exercise in smoke and mirrors, a diversionary charade, um, statements that were intended to be meaningless from the very outset and whose sole purpose is to absorb this growing public and international outrage at what Israel is doing um, to the Palestinians. I, I don't believe there was ever any intention to follow through on any of these um, uh, statements. I think they were intended purely for public consumption mm -hmm. by people who are fully on board with what Israel is doing. And, and really, at the end of the day, fundamentally have absolutely no problem with what Israel is doing, but are acting in this way merely to solve, deflect a political problem that, as they see it, that Israel's conduct 
is creating for themselves and and they have found that this is a best formula um to uh to address and and resolve this problem but at the end of the day they're fully on board they have absolutely no problem with what israel is doing and why am i saying that well Look at what they're doing in terms of unprecedented weapons deliveries. Look at what they're doing in terms of diplomatic protection. Look at all the threats coming out of Washington against the International Criminal Court. Um, these are not the Trumpists in, in the Senate. This is U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken telling the Senate that he is fully open to a bipartisan U.S. campaign um, to take retaliatory measures. against um, uh, the International Criminal Court. And I have to say this again, as far as Washington is concerned, certainly this administration, most certainly its president, its secretary of state, its national security advisor, and uh, its uh, chief um, uh, Middle East uh, point man, for them, Palestinians are not human beings. Palestinians are irrelevant and expendable human scum. The less of them, the better. And and I think what you've said leads on to our final question for today's review, which is um, the pier which Biden promised to build. And again, the, the whole initiative is really a demonstration of American weakness and its inability to exert influence on the Israelis. Everyone knows that the best way to deliver humanitarian assistance is via road but instead of doing that the u.s decided to build a pier and now i mean it's quite ironic and i would say humorous i mean it's hard to find humor in the kind of situation we're in at the moment but this is quite humorous the fact waves have swept away vessels which are supporting the pier which biden installed to transfer aid to gaza and to me the way i look at it is, is it's almost like a perfect metaphor of u.s power and influence being washed away uh, by the rise of global consciousness <laughs> and the wave of global consciousness uh, over Uh, Israel's genocidal campaign in Gaza. That's how I see the metaphor between the 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 um, pier being washed away uh, by the waves and what we're seeing uh, happening to the US on a global stage. How do yeah. you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. No, no so, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that before we we fin well, finish. Well, I think I think this ties directly into um, the issue we were just discussing. The the the. The entire purpose of this pier was to cover for Israel's medieval siege of the Gaza Strip. Israel closed all the land crossings. The U.S. was perfectly fine with that. Again, the U.S. desperately wants to achieve, the, the U.S. desperately wants to see Israel achieve each and every one of its objectives in the Gaza Strip. The U.S.'s only problem with Israel is failure. It's not its conduct. It's Israel's failure to achieve its objectives against Hamas, against the civilian population of the Gaza Strip, and so on. This whole peer project was intended to divert attention from um, uh, the Israeli siege of the Gaza Strip and to cover for it It was an exercise in smoke and mirrors from the very outset. It was a diversionary charade from the very outset. It was never intended to provide urgently needed humanitarian assistance to the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. It was meant to legitimize Israel's deprivation of prohibition on the entry of urgently needed humanitarian assistance in the Gaza Strip. And now we're supposed to believe that the U.S., Navy is incapable of constructing a, um, uh, a temporary pier without it being washed away um, uh, by the first um, uh, wave that, uh, <laughs> that it encounters. I mean, look at what the U.S. Navy is doing in the Red Sea um, to protect uh, Israel and uh, Israeli ships uh, from Houthi missile attacks. Those ships aren't sinking. Um, and I think What has happened to the spear shows the level of interest um, in, in uh, U.S. interest in this whole issue. 
The pier has served its purpose. The pier gave Israel two additional months to starve to death the population of the Gaza Strip. So it can be washed away now. It's mission accomplished. That was my guest, Moin Robani. Thank you, Moin. Thank you very much, Nassim. And thank you all for tuning in. See you next week for another review with me, Nassim Ahmed, and Moin Robani, the weekly memo review show. Bye-bye.